ionizing radiation. It can be used as a source of energy, a means to look beneath the skin of a human being and the surface of all sorts of objects, for checking the integrity of welding, for detecting smoke and fire, for measuring and hence controlling the thickness of materials, as a medical therapy and as a diagnostic and imaging tool. It's a hugely useful and beneficial natural phenomenon. But its power is such that it is vital that people, property and the environment are shielded from it. This short film is about the role played by the International Atomic Energy Agency in protecting people who work with ionizing radiation from its dangerous and potentially deadly effects. Using of ionizing radiation may lead to certain harmful effects and as such it's very much important that every person prescribing the use of ionizing radiation is adequately trained and knowledgeable of these effects. Radiation is a form of energy. Some radiation types can penetrate material and cause a process called ionization. Radioactive materials produce such ionizing radiation. This radiation can damage the chemical structure of biological material, like the cells that make up human organs and tissues. It can affect the DNA, which in turn can lead to cancer. The International Atomic Energy Agency is responsible for protecting people and the environment from the effects of this radiation. In 2014, it hosted a major conference in Vienna on occupational radiation protection, protecting people who work with radiation. The conference attracted delegates from all over the world. The goal to ensure adequate and satisfactory level of radiation protection around the world is a vision for all of us. Our role in radiation protection and radiation protection program is ensure that actually there are adequate uh, radiation standards and guides in place which are being advocated with member states to use and implement them in their national legislations. The agency has a special unit devoted to protecting people who are exposed to radiation in the course of their daily work. It runs the agency's Occupational Protection Program. In IEA, we have a program on occupational radiation protection. The objective of this program is to promoting radiation protection optimization through developing safety standards and guidelines with a international harmonized approach and at the meantime we provide assistance for the application of these standards and the guidelines in the member states. The program is very wide-ranging and covers radiation assessment, monitoring, protection, training, regional workshops and various information services and networks. So the major role of the IEA is to bring the contemporary scientific knowledge to the regulatory language, to the applicable language in legislations, and advocate the use of these standards in the member states' legislations. The program concerns itself with all those people around the world whose jobs involve persistent, sometimes daily, potential exposure to radiation. The nuclear energy industry itself goes without saying, but other areas of concern are less obvious. For instance, those working in medical facilities where radiation is used for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. Those working in other industries, including oil and gas, where radioactive sources are regularly used. And those working in places that expose them to significant levels of natural radiation, coal miners, uranium miners and air crew. The agency is particularly interested in those workplaces where radiation safety regimes are less well established. 
we have several areas we need to focus on. One is typically nuclear power plants. I do believe the nuclear power plants and the radiation protection programs are well set and well established and more observed in most nuclear power plants. So the other focus which we have in the occupational exposure is to direct attention of radiation protection professionals of regulatory authorities in countries to those industries which are not that much under the scrutiny of radiation protection control. This is mining, this is medical field, these are industry like for example industrial radiography. But the principles of radiation protection are the same in all workplaces. They're the consequence of three factors that control the amount or dose of radiation received from a source. The length of time of exposure to the source, the distance from the source, and the shielding from the source. Radiation exposure can be managed by a combination of these factors. So the first principle is to limit the time of exposure because reducing the time reduces the effective dose proportionately. The second principle is to maximize the distance from a source because this reduces the dose due to the inverse square law. And the third principle is to use shielding to limit exposure, introducing a barrier between the worker and the source. These principles are very well established in the nuclear energy industry, a sector which employs around 800,000 people worldwide. For example, here at Torness in the United Kingdom, the time that the workforce is allowed to spend here at the top of the reactor vessel is strictly controlled. Similarly, here at the PAX reactor in Hungary, the control room is located as far away from the reactor vessel as possible. And at this small research reactor in Saclay, France, water seven meters deep acts as a shield between the core and the reactor hall. And at Saclay, as is commonplace with reactors worldwide, the atmospheric pressure in the reactor hall is kept below that of the external environment, so as to contain radioactive contamination within the building. These three principles are also to be seen in practice in another important aspect of the agency's radiation protection program for the mining industry. Here, an excavator is operated by remote control to ensure a safe distance exists between the worker and the radioactive source, in this case, uranium ore. Similarly, at the processing plant, the uranium slurry is remotely unloaded. The IEA is also addressing the other minings than uranium mining, for example, coal mining, because emanation of radioactive materials, for example, radon, from materials in the mines without appropriate uh, ventilation may reach the higher levels. Worldwide, mining for coal is a vast industry. Millions of miners are regularly monitored for exposure to radon. It's a colorless, odorless gas, which can be found throughout the world. The World Health Organization has attributed radon gas to being a significant cause of lung cancer. Generally in coal mines, obviously, we're always monitoring for uh, gases such as methane, for radon, there is two basic methods that we use. We can either use like a small plastic cap, which is uh, left in situ in place for a, a set, set period of time. The other method that we, we generally use is a aggression pump. It looks a little bit like a bicycle pump. We will then take an air sample and designate parts of the mine into that pump itself. It's retained within the tube, it's sent away for analysis. If we discover that we, uh, that we have radon gas in the mines of any levels above 400 becquerels per metre cubed, then obviously we need to then go into what we call an action level. That will start by uh, 
completed the risk assessment. It may be asking us to restrict the hours that some of the miners are actually working underground so that their exposure levels are reduced. Um, we also need to increase the amount of medical surveillance um, that, we, that we do. We have a number of health and safety uh, rules, regulations and acts which are already in place in, in the UK mind. However, we do receive a number of directives from the European Union. The European Union received their advice and guidance from the International Atomic Energy Agency. The International Atomic Energy Agency has a dedicated programme on naturally occurring radioactive materials, NORM. Another important area for the agency's radiation protection programme is in medicine. Ionising radiation is used very extensively, both for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And safe working practices are essential both to protect the patients themselves and the workforce. In this unit, in a hospital in the United Kingdom, the nurse is protected from the radioactive tracer by using a lead-lined syringe. Similarly, the operators of this PET scanner withdraw through lead-lined doors to a control room behind a leaded glass window when the scanner is in use. The radiation doses used in therapeutic medicine, particularly for the treatment of cancer, are much higher. At this hospital, thinking about radiation protection began with the design of the building. Note the thickness of the walls and the way in which the design of the corridor prevents high energy beams of radiation finding their way out of the treatment room. And in all units in the hospital, constant monitoring is used to avoid contamination. Here a treatment room is being checked for traces of radioactivity. The final area of particular interest to the IAEA is industrial radiography. Ionising radiation is used extensively in the testing and grading of wells on pressurised piping, pressure vessels, high capacity storage containers, pipelines and some structural wells including those on aircraft wings. The radioactive sources used for this purpose include iridium-192, selenium-75 and cobalt-60. Here outside Johannesburg, NTP radioisotopes is manufacturing iridium in a research reactor and then packaging it into a form usable as a source for industrial radiography. These iridium-192 sources are minute, measuring 3 mm in diameter and only 0.3 of a millimetre in thickness. But they're a powerful source of gamma radiation, which can penetrate 100 mm of steel. The hot cell operators are protected by 250 mm of lead shielding around the sides of the cell and leaded glass at the front which is nearly a metre thick. The tiny sources are loaded into capsules which are then connected to a jointed cable called a pig's tail. Radiation is like light, it travels in straight lines. So it's very important that when the source is housed within the projector that no radiation escapes the front or the back ports of the projector. To this end, the source assembly is designed of tungsten links which prevent radiation from leaking out the back of the projector and there is a tungsten labyrinth which is in the form of a spiral that prevents radiation leaking out the front of the projector. In a workshop at NTP's site near Johannesburg, the shielded projectors used to house the capsules containing the radioactive source are checked and serviced every time they're loaded with a new source. In addition to the labyrinth, the projectors are designed with a key-operated interlock system to prevent inadvertent removal of the source. Gamma Tech's approach to safety is three words. Safety, safety, safety. 
always safety. At the moment our technician is busy cleaning a deal. This is part of the service, of every single service. Locking mechanisms will be checked. We'll ensure that couplings fit correctly, that the lock moves freely, and we'll use a dummy pigtail to make sure that the movement of the pigtail in the projector is safe and that the lock engages every time. At the rear of the hot cells is the so-called red area, where the sources in their containers are brought out to the dispatch area where they're placarded, checked for contamination and signed out by the radiation protection officer. They can now be delivered to the end user, the radiographer. Industrial radiography does not have a good safety record and is of particular concern to the IAEA. In some parts of the world there are operators using strong sources in remote sites with little supervision, especially when compared with workers in the nuclear industry or hospitals. Here in South Africa, this distributor of radiography projectors values the recommendations and guidelines provided by the IAEA. The IAEA rules and regulations form the backbone of the South African Departments of Health's rules and regulations for radiography in South Africa. And radiographers are trained in accordance with these rules and regulations. Before going out into the field, the radiographer will calculate both the required safe distance from the source to the safety barrier and the time necessary for the exposure. For this, he'll use an internationally accepted radiation safety principle for minimizing radiation doses and releases of radioactive materials. The International Commission on Radiological Protection had developed the concept of as low as reasonably achievable. The acronym is ALARA. And we in radiological professional feel that this is a very important tool. ALARA is not only a sound safety principle, but it is a regulatory requirement for all radiation safety programs. It's one of the cornerstones of the IAEA's approach to radiation protection. Once on site, the first step is to set up the barrier to keep people at a safe distance from the source. An environmental radiation alarm and a slave are set up at the boundary and checked. The radiographer also has a personal dosimeter. The projector can now be set up. A tungsten collimator with a 60 degree angled port is taped onto the pipe and the film is taped onto the opposite side. The area is then cleared of people. I'll just get out the barrier please. The adjoining properties checked and the perimeter radiation levels checked. The radiographer and his assistant step outside the barrier and the preparations are now complete. The yellow guide tube allows the source to be wound out of its shielded housing in the labyrinth inside the projector and into the collimator. As soon as the source is out of its shielding in the projector, it sets off the environmental radiation alarm. After timing the exposure, calculated in the office, the source is wound back in. When the film is processed, a detailed examination can be made of the metallurgical integrity of the pipe. A safe and quite new alternative to this method is to use a shielding blanket that limits the spread of the radiation. But whatever the advances in technology, Radiation protection is ultimately the responsibility of the individual workers concerned and the safety culture established by the organization's management. Industrial radiography companies are under a lot of pressure from their customers to perform uh, a lot of work in a very short space of time and therefore the radiographers are put under a lot of pressure to do this as well. If the radiographer does not put safety first every single time that he's doing work, it can be a very big problem in terms of danger to himself and to members of the public and can lead to disastrous consequences. Clearly, the agency cannot oversee the millions of applications of ionizing radiation that take place in workplaces all over the world every day. 
But as well as establishing safety standards and guideline standards, its work in assessing and monitoring exposure in education and training, in the establishment of information networks and systems, the IAEA does a great deal to encourage strict adherence to the principles and practices set out in this film. The Radiation Safety and Monitoring section has a very popular website where a great deal of information can be found and where educational materials can be downloaded. For occupational radiation protection and the International Action Plan on Occupational Radiation Protection, we created a web page. It's Offnet, Occupational Radiation Protection Networks. And uh, it's a uh, focal point for occupational radiation protection. And you can find all the information on occupational radiation protection on this web page. We prepare seven posters for protection of workers in different sectors. One of the most valuable services the IAEA provides is the Occupational Radiation Protection Appraisal Service, OPAS. These provide an opportunity for member states to have their occupational radiation protection programs independently assessed and evaluated. This is often useful to maintain or enhance the effectiveness of the program and to identify in an objective and unbiased manner the areas where improvements may be required. It also allows information on best practices from the host country to be made available to other member states. Many countries are approaching IEA to ensure that the ORPAS mission is being undertaken. Another very popular service to member states is the Information System on Occupational Exposure, or ISO. This is jointly operated by the IAEA and OECD Nuclear Energy Agency and provides broad and regularly updated information on methods to improve the protection of workers and on occupational exposure in nuclear power plants. It ensures that the good practice on occupational radiation protection is shared about most uh, nuclear power stations with operators. And yet another service is ISMIR, the Information System on Occupational Exposure in Medicine, Industry and Research. ISMIR IR is a tool for radiation protection optimization in non-destructive testing companies carrying out industrial radiography, IR. ISMIR IR is developed as a web-based tool for regular data collection and analysis of occupational doses for individuals in IR and for the use of this information to improve occupational radiation protection. ...and the development and implementation of programs that will contribute to the safety and health of workers and workplaces. So, under the umbrella of the Occupational Protection Programme, the IAEA provides a comprehensive service to member states, and a vital one too. Because with more and more people working with the wonderful tool of ionising radiation every day, effective workplace radiation protection programmes become more and more important. It is essential that the highest priority is given to all aspects of safety so that we can enjoy the many benefits of peaceful nuclear technology while minimizing the risks. Ionizing radiation is a wonderful tool, but it should be used wisely. <laughs>